so one of the exercises I know you do is you you and you have alluded to it the T, just like in uh, in accounting assets liabilities pros and cons. So it's the controllables and, and the uncontrollables, correct? Right, yeah, and that's yeah. a nice exercise that really, whenever there's kind of two outcomes, right, or you want to categorize things, that's that's a good exercise. So here it applies in yep. in this case. So let let's go back first though to when you went to that meet and you had that kind of that first um, uh, session, well, a series of sessions with your coworker, yeah. and you go to compete. I'm assuming he had he had asked you to do that. Is or is thinking about the uncontrollables, and and it's hard. I guess I, the reason I'm bringing this up when it comes to like weightlifting or powerlifting, right? Um, I I think of other things where you can't control, but as I was thinking about this, I was like, wow, how much of it really is? Wouldn't there? It's seemingly there's more that could be should be in control of someone that's powerlifting. But help me walk through what is the uncontrollables. Oh wow! So when, when it comes to that, I think it's easy. Let me start with the controllables. Okay. Because that list gets very, it usually is very small. Mm -hmm. It's it really comes down to effort. So you can control the effort you bring. It's uh, attitude. So I call that mindset. You know, am I coming in with a, a confident attitude? Am I coming in with um, energy, not a lot of emotion, um, and then focus? And so when you converse that and look at what you can't control at a powerlifting meet, you can't control the venue. Like right, okay. where, wherever you lift is where you lift. Just like you can't control what condition the football field's in after it rains. Right. Or the baseball field after it rains. Um, so venue, you can't control that. You can't control other lifters, what they do, how they warm up. Um, temperature of the room. Temperature of the room. I've been in, I, one of the first meets I did locally was in a CrossFit box and, I think it was July. It was just a sauna. And I mean, by the end of the day, you were just, you were just shredded. Um, so the venue, other lifters. Uh, so in a competition, when you step on the platform to do competitive squat, bench, or deadlift, you have judges that evaluate your lift. And so it's extremely strict. It's not just like what you see in a gym where guys are bouncing bench off their chest, yeah. you know, for bench press, it's, you have judges that tell you what to do and how to do it, and you got to follow their commands. And on bench, you pause on your chest for count of one one thousand usually. Then you got to press it. So it's very structured mm -hmm. at those meets, but you can't control the judges. So there's times you, and they give you white light. There's three judges, so they give you a white light for if it's a good lift or red light if it's a bad lift. Mm -hmm. You if you get two out of three white lights, then it's a good lift. You can you can throw the red light out, right? So some judges are super strict. Uh, when I competed at a, it was a North American Championships two years ago, all the judges were international judges. And it, there, I got red lighted for stuff I'd never even heard of. Like, I get a red light, I'm like, I don't even know what happened. <laughs> I go talk to the judge, and he's like, well, you did this. And I'm like, I've never even heard of that. So the, the judging can be very strict uh, at, mm -hmm. the, at the very higher levels of, of, of competition. So um, you may not be able to control the, the night of sleep you had, yeah. you know, because maybe you're nervous or whatever. It's just maybe it was a rough week. So, I mean, there's so many things outside of your control um, that you learn to focus only on what you can't control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start feeling nervous and anxious, that's probably a sign that you're like, I'm probably thinking about stuff I can't control. I always say that's like your check engine light on a car. Um, there is a certain amount of stress and nervousness that is good for you. And a lot of times what we don't think, what we don't realize is the same emotions that I'm feeling when I'm like excited mm -hmm. and I'm confident are the same emotions and feelings as when I'm nervous and stressed. It's just how I'm interpreting it. Your body's actually getting ready to perform. So it's learning in your mind, hey, um, I'm getting ready to do something good. This isn't anything bad. But I get you just get super specific on things that you can control and know what you can't control. And over time, it's a mental skill. It's a skill because it's a mental skill and you got to work on it. Mm -hmm. But over time, you think about those things you can't control and you just learn to put your attention, focus on things you can control. Yeah. Think about in your line of work, business development. Yeah. If you could land, <sighs> how much is outside of your control? Proposals, work, meetings, yeah. everything you do to go in to get that contract. There's so much outside of your control in that process, and you just learn to control the process. Yeah, and it's interesting uh, as 
we uh, had a lot of those conversations this week. There was a, a lot of people in town for the uh, in, to try to chase the FBI work, right? Yeah. So a lot of BD people. And sometimes people may um, be critical of your company, whatever company you work for. You know, and you're like, look, that whatever that is, that only rep- that represents a small part of the company. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean we're all knuckleheads and failures or right. something like that, right? I mean, you know, I, I, we do the best we can to uh, control the reputation or the quality of the work we do for right. our program or our sector, whatever it may be. And that, but there's a lot of other things and other human beings at play, right? That that contribute to that success or not. So you're absolutely right. I've actually I, even before, now that we're talking about it, it's really setting in my mind where I've had a lot of those conversations with myself, like, hey, there's only so much you can, you can control, do. Yeah, right? there's only so All much. All you can do is the best you can. Yeah, and so the other um, the other exercise I do with teams, you know, when you talk about the T, controllables, uncontrollables, mm-hmm. then we talk about this thing called a process mindset or an outcome mindset or a results mindset. And so a process mindset really understands uh, what it takes to accomplish a goal. So like day in, day out. So like I'll talk, you know, and then a results mindset, we always have to have a result we're chasing. I mean, nothing great happens without a goal or a result or something you're tangibly going after. But to live there and fixate on it isn't good. Um, Because here's the example. You have a high school athlete, let's just pick basketball. They want to go to a certain college Mm -hmm. on scholarship. Um, Let's say they're getting recruited, but maybe during their – senior year they're just not performing the way they want to and all of a sudden their mind's going to start playing all these stories and scenarios i didn't drop 20 uh that yeah. coach isn't going to be interested in me uh i've got to i've got to do better next game and then what if they don't you know and they get in this results mindset which is all about accomplishment and not about your process mm-hmm. so the really great ones kill process like live and like live, die, breathe, execute process, which is, I know what I need to do to get the result I want, but I have a I have a detailed systematic plan every day, every week that gets me there, and they spend eighty percent of their time there. They'll check in with the goal to see if I'm mm-hmm. still tracking. Is it the right goal? Do I got it? Uh, but twenty percent of the time, they they are looking at that result, they're looking at that outcome that they want, but then eighty percent of it is just religious execution of the process yeah and that's where they spend their time because that's the stuff that you can control in your line of work have you guys not done any everything correctly cross your t's dot your i's submitted the yeah the documents to the to the uh, client that wants you and formatted everything right and and it just didn't didn't come to pass yeah they selected somebody else but you guys relentlessly executed the process you know, to wring your hands over, are we going to win that contract? Yeah. You know, give yourself an ulcer. Well, it's like even uh, when I was just talking earlier about if we were dependent right now on if this was live, you know, if the internet goes out, I, I can't do anything about that. And that's right. happened to me when I was doing games in the past, right? Yeah, I would do everything I could do to control the, the you know, the software version, you know, the, um, how we built the the screens, yep. you know, for the viewers. How you build your story, your script, blah blah right. blah, and then you have an internet problem, and you do everything you know you can to fix it, and then you feel terrible. You've let people down, but at the same time, like I'm, I, I would learn to like. There was nothing I could do. There was nothing I could do in that plan, situation. Plan right? B. I'm not calling Verizon. Yeah. yeah. You know and. and and that you know they're gonna just fix some you know some backhoe probably cut a wire somewhere and they're not gonna fix it just for me for right. my high school game. Yeah, by tra- uh, my full time job I do employee learning and development, so it's a lot of facilitation, a lot of training, uh, managing leader development programs. Every in- every facilitator, instructor, teacher has stepped into a classroom, uh, a conference room, to deliver fill in the blank leader leader class, <laughs> and technology just doesn't doesn't work doesn't work. You know, and you just, I've learned to have a plan B, C, and D, and just, you know, if this doesn't work, then you just, early in my career, I freaked out, because I'm like, these people are going to think I'm incompetent, and what, you know, they're never, they're not going to want Roger Kitchen back, and, you know, you, you're, you play all these stories in your head. Yeah. And then after, over 
you know, just time and experience and, you know, you're like, okay. Yeah. It's just plan B. And if plan B doesn't work, I'll, I got a plan C, you know, but you just roll with it. You so, learn to roll with it. So somewhat going back to that process, it almost feels like, um, you need to enjoy practice if it's an athlete, mm. right? And, and there's there's games. You know, football's once a week. You know, soccer, baseball, maybe a few times a week. Cross country doesn't matter what it is. Right, fill in the, yeah, um, fill in the blank sport. It's are some of the passion is. Do you love? I guess if you love the sport enough, and then you really need to fall in love with. It's kind of like this con- this term I've heard of embracing the suck. Yeah, it, yeah. it sucks. No one really likes to go and. And, and practice and or the different elements of practice if you're a runner right you better hit the pavement but when you learn that that's like it's sometime it's going to be over right, right. you're only right. going to be young or enjoy this enjoy this moment yeah so it's almost like and i don't know if you do this exercise with kids like you just have to enjoy the whole um journey right every workout uh, and and I think once you get there, then you understand. Like, I actually like to be in the gym and be sweaty and hot. Right. And, and kind of just for a moment take in that feeling, like, I feel good. Right. Even though a few hours later you might be a little sore, you might be moving around a little bit slowly. Yeah. But um, I think that's kind of what you're getting at, too, with not just it's, – it's falling in love or really being dedicated to the process. The, it's the de- you can tell the difference between athletes who like their sport and love it. There's just a different mentality. It's yeah. a different way they approach things. Um, it's very easy to see who likes it, who loves it. Uh, I will do this exercise with teams where I've got like a quadrant and it breaks down competitiveness. So if you're a one, you're hyper competitive. Like you're always on, love competition. You, you get like this endorphin rush from like beating other people. You challenge yourself, you challenge other people like just a relentless pursuit of practice and competition. Mm-hmm. Like you just eat it, live it, breathe it. They're, they're your, it's like LeBron James, Steph Curry, Michael Phelps, uh, Simone Biles, you know, they're wired like that. Obviously back in our generation, it's the Kobe Bryant's and Michael Jordan's. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have like people that fall in the second category, which is they're competitive. There are two, um, they're selectively competitive, but they work hard they rise to the occasion. Um, they're, uh, they will work. It's just one level down. So they're not always on, Mm -hmm. um, but they will be competitive when they need to, but they're selective about their competitiveness. But again, they work hard. Uh, you can win championships with a bunch of twos on your team. Then you've got this bucket. That's a three, which is they're somewhat competitive. So they're kind of on, they're off. Um, you know, sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they want to work, sometimes they don't. And it, it's just kind of this inconsistent where at times they can play really well mm-hmm. and they can compete really well, but it's like, do they want to and will they? And so I'll actually sit down with a team and just have them self-assess. Like, where are you on this? And there's no, there's no right answer. And some sports that have cuts – you know, you're going for the ones and the twos. Even mm-hmm. Some threes may not make it unless you really go, I think the kid's got potential or that athlete's got potential. I'm willing to work with them. And so you really get into how competitive they are. So come back to the whole practice thing. If you're a one or a two, you're going to embrace practice a little bit differently. Um, if you love your sport, you may not love training all the time. Yeah. Um, but you have this goal out in front of you and you've got this ethereal thing you're chasing and you've got a lot of mojo and like energy and, and like you have a lot of emotion behind it. And that's the thing that you fixate on that when like the training's just mundane and it's not, it's not fun. There's just days you're, you know, there's just days realistically you're not a hundred percent. Maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep. Maybe you've been sick, you know, or whatever, whatever fill in that blank challenge may be. But that thing out there that you've got emotion and feeling attached to that you want to accomplish is really what pulls you through.